from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Jane Wyman, Faye Bater, and Frank Lovejoy in The Glass Menagerie. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight in Warner Brothers, The Glass Menagerie, we will tell you the story of a young girl whose shyness and sensitivity prevented her enjoying the usual romantic adventures of young people. Until the advent of a gentleman caller, a young man who was to change the life of her frivolous mother and erratic brother, as well as her own. When Charles K. Feldman turned this New York Dramatic Critics Circle Award winning play into an unforgettable motion picture, Jane Wyman played the lovely but timorous daughter. And co-starring with her tonight will be two outstanding artists, Faye Bainter and Frank Lovejoy. Now act one of The Glass Menagerie, starring Jane Wyman as Laura Wingfield, Faye Bainter as Amanda Wingfield, and Frank Lovejoy as Tom Wingfield. Far out on the Atlantic Ocean, a lonely little freighter butts her way through the murky seas. It's long past midnight. The decks are deserted, except for the young man who stands his watch. These are the quiet hours when a man plays solitaire with a deck of old cards in his heart. He remembers places and people. I remember the city. The washed-out, weary middle of it. And a certain alley and the grimy brick walls concealing furious and desperate living in the dark and shabby rooms we called our place of residence. It was the light on my sister's collection of glass that first caught my eyes when I woke up in the morning. Little glass animals as fragile as Laura herself. Rise and shine, Laura. Laura, honey, tell that brother of yours to get up. Tom, Tom, it's time to get up. It's after seven. Rise and shine. Oh, I'll rise. But I won't shine. Tom, apologize to Mother. Uh, what for? Well, you made her very angry last night, but if you'll apologize, then she'll start speaking. Her not speaking? That's such a tragedy. Oh, Tom, please. All right. All right, I'll tell her I'm sorry. Look, honey, didn't I ask you to go to the delicatessen for some butter? Yes, Mother. Well, just a quarter of a pound of butter and tell him to charge. Mr. Schultz makes such a terrible face when I say that. And, honey, try to look like a lady on the street. We don't want to imitate our common neighbors, now, do we? But I'm not going to meet anyone, Mother. If you take that attitude, Laura, you never will. I watched Laura from the bathroom window, limping down the street, timid, frightened, hoping no one would see her. She'd been like this always. Maybe it was all because of her leg and the limp. I'm not sure. Your breakfast ready. You better get up if you... Oh, I forgot. I'm not talking to you. Mother, I apologize. I'm sorry we quarreled. I make myself hateful to my children. No, you don't. I've had to put up a solitary battle all these years, ever since your father deserted us and went off to see the world. Just promise me one thing, son. Promise me you'll never be a drunkard. I promise I'll never be a drunkard. In these trying times, all we have to cling to is each other. Yes, Mother. Tom, I, I sent Laura out so I could discuss something with you. Oh? You know how your sister is, so quiet. Oh, but still, waters run deep, and she notices things. Uh, just the other day, I came in, and she was crying. Well, what about? About you. She has an idea you're not happy. Not happy? Me? Whatever gave her that idea? Uh, gives her any idea. Could I have my coffee, Mother? Mm, oh, yes. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not criticizing, Tom, but you do act strange. And life hasn't been easy for me, son. I know, Mother. With all these faults, I... I loved your father, but when I see you taking on his ways... What's that got to do with Laura? Well, we got to make plans and provisions, that's what. Oh, you've made provisions. You've badgered me into taking all my savings and investing them in this, this business course for Laura. It's a waste, an absolute waste. Why is it waste to prepare her? Because for... Laura is not cut out for it. I've tried everything else. Will you name me one stone your mother's left unturned? All she does is fool around those pieces of glass and play those worn-out phonograph records. I don't know that that's any kind of a life for a pretty young girl to be leading. Well, I guess she's the type that people call home girls. There's no such type. Oh, I can see the handwriting on the wall. It's terrifying. 
I mean, the way you remind me of your father. Oh, I saw that letter from the merchant marine. I saw it. What letter? They accepted your application. Why, you had no right to. Now, give me that letter, Mother. Give it to me. I know just what you're up to. When did this come? Yesterday, and I haven't had a minute's peace since I opened it. All right. All right, you go. Go whichever way the wind drifts you. But not until there's somebody here to take your place. What are you talking about? Responsibility. You can go when your sister's married and got a home of her own, and not until then. But you don't think of anything but yourself. Self, self. But oh, Tom, honey, don't you know of some nice young man who'd come and call on your sister? Mother, are you suggesting that I... Mother, oh, you should have heard what Mr. Schultz said when I asked him to charge it. Don't you quote that mercenary man to me. I don't want to know what he said now or ever. I was so embarrassed, Mother. Don't you ever get embarrassed, honey. Just you remember that the Wingfields were the first white people to settle on the soil of the state of Mississippi. You said it. Laura, where are you going, honey? Well, my glass collection. I haven't dusted it yet. But you'll be late for business college. Uh, yes, Mother. You're right. Now, now, just a moment, honey. You can't leave the house without money. Here. For lunch and coffee. Thank you. Goodbye, Mother. Tom. Bye. Now, use the streetcar, honey. Our public transportation system should be used liberally. After all, we pay for it out of our taxes. Goodbye, honey. Goodbye, Mother. Well... But what, dear? Anything else to tell me this morning? Not a thing. Then I'll go to work. But you will try, won't you, Tom? While you're there, you'll try to find a nice, clean, wholesome boy for your sister. Just take it easy, Mom. See you later. All I ask is of you to try. For Laura, Tom. Find somebody for Laura. And so our days began... Laura at Business College and me at the Mid-Continental Shoe Company warehouse. My employment was like a long, lingering sickness with each day maybe the last, depending on the boss's patience and mine, and both running out fast. And then at 6 o'clock, I'd be home again. Supper's ready, Tom. Hmm? Oh. Hmm. What are you looking at? Your collection, your glass menagerie. Something's different, though. Look again. This one, it's new. It's beautiful. I, I found it today. You found it? I bought it. Everything in the window was half price. No lunch, hmm? It's a, it's, a, it's a unicorn, like a horse with a horn in the middle of its forehead. It's pretty, Laura. It's real pretty. How was school? All right. I, all right, I guess. Supper's ready, Tom. Too fast, Tom. You know what happens if you don't chew your food? Yes, Mother. Now, animals, they have secretions in their stomach which enable them to digest their food without chewing. But human beings must chew their food before they swallow it down. I prefer to gulp. Don't you want to give your salivary glands a chance to function? You know what I really want, Mother? I want peace. And peace has got very little to do with my salivary glands. My salivary glands are getting along fine. Now, please... Just leave me alone. You are not excused from the table. I'm going to get a cigarette. You smoke too much. I'll bring the coffee, Mother. Oh, no, honey, no. Just resume your chair, little sister. We've got to keep you fresh and pretty for your gentleman callers. I'm not expecting any gentleman callers, Mother. Well, but sometimes they arrive when we least expect them. We have to be prepared. Fortunately, when I was your age, I understood the art of conversation. I'll bet she did. I remember one Sunday afternoon in the Blue Mountains. Oh, no, not again. Oh, let her tell it, Tom. We've heard it 500 times. She loves to tell it. I'm listening, Mother. Yeah, what about that Sunday in the Blue Mountain? Only have one Sunday afternoon, mind you. I received 17 gentlemen callers. And I entertained them all there at our plantation in the Blue Mountain. I tell you, they were some of the most prominent men in the Mississippi Delta. But it wasn't enough in those days for a girl to have a pretty face and a graceful figure. You had to have a nimble wit and a tongue to meet all occasions. I, I remember how every one of my gentlemen It went on and on and on. And every time she told it, her eyes would shine and she'd be thrilled and happy just thinking about it. And that one night, mind you... I received nine serious proposals of marriage. Do you know something? I could have married Jay Duncan Fitzhugh. It's a very interesting story, Mother. But what did I do? I went right out of my way and picked your father. Just think of it. 
I could have been Mr. J. Duncan Fitzhugh, Jr. I'll clear the table, Mother. You stay fresh and pretty, darling. How many gentlemen callers do you suppose we're going to entertain this evening? I don't think there'll be any, Mother. No, what? Well, you must be joking. My word, there must have been a flood. There must have been a tornado. Oh, there's no flood, Mother. There's no tornado. I, I'm just not as popular as you were in Blue Mountain. Mother's afraid, Tom. Mother's afraid I'm going to be an old maid. Don't you ever use that expression, honey. I don't care for it. Was that your writing, Tom? Is it an answer to the Merchant Marine? It's poetry, Mother. Believe it or not, sometimes I write poetry. Mm-hmm. You think you can sell it? Let me see. No, I'd, I'd rather not. Why do you always hide things from me? Because unless I do, there isn't a thing, not a single thing in this house I can call my own. You just lower your voice. I got something to say to you. I've had enough. I'm going on. Now, you listen to me. I'm at the end of my patience. Well, where do you think I'm at? Don't you think I have any patience to reach the end of, Mother? You don't care about us. I'm only your mother, but you should care about your sister a little. That's what you should. All you think of is yourself. Yeah, that's right. Just myself. I'm crazy about that warehouse. I'm in love with mid-continental shoes. Think I want to spend the rest of my life in that icebox interior with those fluorescent tubes, but I go. And every morning you come in yelling, rise and shine, rise and shine. I think how lucky dead people are, but I get up and I go. How dare you raise your voice to your mother? You see that picture? Father's picture? Well, if self were the only thing I thought of, Mother, I'd be where he is. Gone as far as the system of transportation reaches. Only right now I can only go as far as the movies. I don't believe you go to the movies at all. You're right. You're absolutely right. I go to opium dens. <laughs> dens of vice and criminal hangouts. I'm a hired assassin. I carry a Tommy gun and a violin case. I'm leading a double life. By day I'm a poor warehouse worker, but by night I'm a dynamic czar of the underworld. Mother, my enemies plan to dynamite the place. Oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> and they're going to blow us all up. And you'll go up, up over the Blue Mountains. And you'll go on a broomstick. Up on a broomstick with 17 gentlemen callers trailing behind you. Tom! Oh, dear. Oh, now, you see what you've done? Smashed one of a pretty little animal. Laura, I'm sorry. It was an accident. Oh, yes, I know it. Just an accident. Good night, Mother. I'll never speak to you again as long as I live. Do you hear me? Never. Not until you apologize. I went to the show, and then I went to a saloon, and I got drunk. Not very drunk, just high. And when I came home, Laura was still up waiting for me. Tom, I was worried. I just went to the movies. And I saw everything twice. They had a magician on that stage. Wonderful. It was amazing. He sold souvenirs, and I bought one for you. It's a scarf. It's a magic scarf. Oh, it's lovely, Tom. He waved it over a cage. And he changed canaries into goldfish. Isn't that a pretty scarf? It's beautiful. I wish it were big enough to cover this whole ugly world. The world isn't ugly, Tom. While I was waiting for you, I listened to the music. They're still playing. The music? Oh, oh, yeah. Down the street, the dance hall. It was beautiful. The whole world was beautiful. You know, that magician, he had the, the wonderfulest trick of them all. What was it? Well, they nailed him in a packing blouse, and he got out of it without removing a single nail. <laughs> There's a trick that come in handy for me. Get me out of that warehouse. Mars! Shh. Shh. You'll wake Mother. You'll pay her back for all those rise and shines. <laughs> Laura, you know it doesn't take much intelligence to get yourself nailed up in a box. But who in the world ever got out of one without removing one single nail? Tom. <laughs> Look at him there on the wall. You got out, didn't you, Father? You got out all right. Sometime I'm going to buy a medal and I'm going to hang it on that picture frame. 
My father was a hero. He did an heroic deed. Tom. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Good night, Tom. Act two of the Glass Menagerie in a moment. Our American servicemen stationed around the world have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. And they're finding out that these ideas of other people aren't so strange after all. For instance, the use of masks in various countries is pretty widespread. It's not confined just to the tribes of Africa. In Japan, the actors of the famous No dramas wear masks to indicate the character they're portraying. The mumming plays of England are centuries old, and the masks worn during these plays are in the strictest tradition. In Spain, Italy, and France, masks are worn during certain religious holidays and for local celebrations. Well, all this might sound strange, but as our servicemen have observed, we've made it part of our culture, too. We have masquerade parties and masked balls. We have the famous Mardi Gras in New Orleans. At Halloween, our kids wear the masks of witches, skeletons, goblins, and ghosts. For the price of one box stop, our younger generation can also assume the identity of anyone from the Lone Ranger to Jerry Lewis by putting on a mask. The same is true of other customs and traditions around the world. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. And they're important to the people who follow them. Our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing the customs of other people in other lands. And now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of The Glass Menagerie, starring Jane Wyman as Laura, Faye Bainter as Mrs. Wingfield, and Frank Lovejoy as Tom, with Tom Brown as Jim O'Connor. The young man thinks about his past. The young man who stands watch on a scrubby little freighter. 3,000 miles away from the scenes that live so vividly in his memory. Laura never told us about her failure at business college. How one day she simply left her class and limped out of the building and never returned. It was weeks, however, before our mother discovered it. Mother, is anything the matter? Why are you staring at me? I went to a business college today to find out how my daughter was getting along. Oh. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. I'm sorry, Mother. I, it isn't the money I care about. It's all my hopes and ambitions for you. Just gone up the spot. Laura, where were you? Where did you go when you were supposed to be in your classroom? I, I just went walking, Mother. Just walking, huh? Deliberately trying to wear yourself out. I didn't walk all the time. Sometimes I went inside places to rest. Inside where? Well, the library and the park. And lately, I've been spending my afternoons in the big glass house where they grow tropical flowers. Tropical flowers? La, what are we going to do for the rest of our lives? Just sit in this room and watch the parades go by? Amuse ourselves with a glass menagerie? Laura, what is there left for us but dependency for the rest of our days? Oh, I won't be dependent, Mother. I'll, I'll go out and find work. Work? What work? I know so well what becomes of unmarried women who aren't prepared to occupy a position in life. Barely tolerated spinsters living on some brother's wife or sister's husband. Stuck away in some little mouse trap of a room, eating the crust of humility all their lives. Is that the future we've mapped out for ourselves? Oh, no. Well, I declare it's the only alternative I can think of. Of course, some girls get married. Honey, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get you married. But, Mother, I'm crippled. Don't use that word. How many times have I been told you never, never to use that word? It just have a slight effect, that's all. Hardly noticeable. People have a slight defect, but they cultivate other things to make up for it. They develop charm and vivacity and, and charm. Girls who aren't cut out for a career in the business world usually end up married to some nice young man. But, Mother, who would want to marry... You're not a cripple. Walk, Laura. Why? You walk. I want to see you walk. Walk around this room. Go on, walk. 
You're not crippled. You're not. You're not. Mother often would say, I feel just like giving up. But this was a lie. Giving up was the last idea that would enter her mind. After Laura's failure at the business college, Mother concentrated on her obsession of somehow finding a gentleman caller. Rarely an evening passed without a frantic appeal to bring home a nice young man from the warehouse to call on my sister. Well, there was a nice young man at the warehouse, a fellow named Jim O'Connor. Getting hungry, Tom? I can eat. I sent Laura out with some cold cuts. <laughs> Fire escape landing's a pretty poor excuse for the veranda I used to have back home. When I was a girl, we used to do all our entertaining on the veranda in the summer. Tom, you smoke too much. Yeah. A pack a day or 21 cents a pack? How much of that be in a month? Enough to give you a night school course at Washington U. Now, wouldn't that be lovely? I'd rather smoke. I know. That's the tragedy of What are you looking at? The moon. I'm contemplating the rise of the moon over Schultz's delicatessen. Why, so there is a little silver slipper of a moon. Did you make a wish? Uh Uh-huh. I wish the success and happiness for my two precious children. I get so weary wishing that all the time. I thought perhaps you wished for a gentleman caller. Whatever gave you that idea? Well, you asked me to bring one home often enough. I never asked. I suggested. Well, I'm going to bring one. I've asked him to come to dinner. <laughs> oh, perfectly lovely. It, it, it's definite. Yes, very definite. How soon? Well, Friday night soon enough. Friday night? That gives me no time, no time at all. No time for what, Why, well, for preparations, of course. You should have phoned me the minute he accepted. But you don't have to make any fuss. He has very simple taste. And He's... I tell you, you can't have a gentleman caller in a pigsty. <laughs> Now, look, if you don't stop this nonsense, I'll tell them not to come. Oh, don't tell me one. People hate broken engagements. Why, well, they got no place to go. Where'd you meet him? At the warehouse. What's his name, sir? Jim O'Connor. O'Connor. Irish. Coming on Friday. Fish. Does he drink? No, no, Mother, not that I know of. Nothing I want less for my daughter than a man who drinks. Aren't you being just a little bit premature? How much does he make, son, his salary? Well, I'd uh, judge it to be approximately uh, $210 a month. Well, sir, that's not princely now, is it? Well, it's 20 more than I make. Mm, I don't know. But for a family man... Mr. O'Connor is not a family man. Well, he might be sometime. You're sure he doesn't drink, son? I'll call him on the phone and ask... Don't you be supercilious with your mother. These things have to be investigated discreetly to save a girl from making a tragic mistake. How did you happen to make such a tragic mistake, Mother? (laughs) That innocent look on your father's face had everybody fooled. I declare that man could charm the tail feathers off a jaybird. Did you tell him you had a sister? No, Mother. I didn't let on that we had a dark ulterior motive. When he sees how sweet and pretty and lovely she is, you just thank his lucky stars. That's what he'll do. Mother, don't expect too much of Laura. And just what do you mean by that? Well, she seems all those things to you and me because she's ours and we love her. We don't even notice anymore that she's crippled. Don't use that word. Well, she is. She's different from other girls. You have to face the facts. She's terribly shy. She lives in the little world of glass animals. She plays old phonograph records. Well, you just be quiet. She's coming now. I'm going in and lie down. You wore me out, Mother. Let me know when supper. Laura? Hurry, honey. I got news. I got the best news ever. I've got the cold cuts, Mother. I'm sorry I took so long, but the store was closed. Oh, now, you just come up and step for a minute. Laura, honey, come Friday night, we're to have a gentleman caller. Mother... Well, you might look a little pleased about it, honey. Now, come on and make a wish on the moon. A wish? Look over there. A silver slipper of a moon. What do I wish for? Happiness and good fortune. Just a little happiness, Laura. And a little good fortune. That was Tuesday. And from Tuesday to Friday, Mother never stopped. Her preparations for the gentleman caller included, of course, a new dress for Laura. Her mother made the dress herself. There. 
all finished, La, honey. And I must say, you look like a dream. It's lovely, and thank you, Mother. Well, honey... I believe you're trembling. Well, it, it's just that you make me so nervous. Well, now, how do I make you nervous? Well, all this fuss, you, you make it seem so important. I, declare, I don't understand you at all. Every time I try to do anything the least bit different for you, you always seem to set yourself again. Oh, I'm sorry, Mother. Oh, that's better. Now, go look at yourself in the mirror. No. No, wait. What are you doing? Improvements, honey. They're called gay deceivers. Well, I won't wear them. You will. Why should I? You make it seem as though we were setting a trap. We are. All pretty girls. Traps. Pretty traps. Men expect them to be. And now, young lady, go look at yourself. Pretty as an angel on a postcard. I I still wish we didn't have to fuss so much. What's his name, Mother? O'Connor. Jim O'Connor. I declare I never knew a Jim that wasn't nice. I... I knew a Jim O'Connor in high school. Did you not? If it's the same one, you'll have to excuse me. I, I won't come to the table. Won't come to the table? What nonsense is this? Whether it's him or not, you won't be excused from this particular table. Well, I have to be. I am not going to humor your silliness, Laura. I've had just about enough from you and your brother both. <laughs> now, honey, you just compose yourself and let them in when they arrive. Please don't make me open the door. Why, you'll be in the kitchen busy, making the dressing for the salmon. All oh, this silliness over one gentleman caller. What would you do if there were 17? <laughs> Laura, Laura, the door. Tom must have forgotten his key. Mother, please, you go to the door. Why have you chosen this moment to lose your mind? Oh, please, Mother, please. I, I can't. I, I'm sick. Just a second, Tom, honey. Laura Wingfield, you march right to that door and let them in. Now do as I tell you. Yes, Mother. Well, hello, Laura. Um... Uh... This is Jim. Jim, this is my sister, Laura. Oh, I didn't know you had a sister. Well, pleased to meet you. How do you do? Hey, your hands are cold, Laura. Yes, I, I've been playing the Victrola. Excuse me. What's the matter? Oh, Laura? Oh, she's, uh, she's very shy. Oh, oh, shy, huh? Hey, you never mentioned you had a sister. Tom? Yes, Mother? Is that you and Mr. O'Connor? Yes, Mother. Now, you just make yourselves comfortable. Ask Mr. O'Connor if he'd like to wash his hands. Oh, well, well, thanks, but I took care of that at the warehouse. Hey, who's that, the, the fancy photograph? Oh, that's my father. He used to work for the telephone company, and he fell in love with long distance. He's been absent for 16 years. <laughs> yeah, he's smiling. Uh, picture, I mean. He's laughing at us. Jim, I just assume you didn't mention anything to my mother about my plans. You know, the Merchant Marine. Oh, whatever you say, Shakespeare. I paid my dues this month instead of the light bill. Oh, you'll be sorry when they turn the lights off. <laughs> I won't be here. <laughs> How could you do a thing like that? Take it easy. Here's my mother. Good evening, gentlemen. Why, mother, you look so pretty. Thank you, son. But I wish you'd look pleasant when you're going to say something pleasant so I could expect it. So this is Mr. O'Connor. Well, how do you do, Mrs. Wingfield? I've heard so much about you from my boy. I finally said, Tom, I said, good gracious, why don't you invite this, this paragon to supper? Now, Mother. Ah, it's been warm. I do hope the rain's going to cool things off. Oh, I, I think it will. Uh, supper about ready, Mother? Better our sister. You just tell her that you two big hungry men are waiting for her. You met Laura, Mr. Connor. Oh, yes, ma'am. She... She's very pretty. Oh, yes, ma'am. She's domesticated, too. Very rare to find a girl as sweet and pretty and lovely as Laura and so domesticated. I never was at all. Oh, oh no. I... No, I wasn't now. <laughs> I never could make a thing but an angel food cake. But then, of course, in the South, we had so many servants. Gone, gone, gone. 
All vestige of gracious living just gone completely. Well, yeah. It's, uh, well, I, I mean... Uh, well, I just wasn't prepared for what the future dealt me, Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, yes. I married a man who worked for the telephone company. He fell in love with long distance. Yes, I, I know, Tom... He was... started to travel and just kept on traveling. Looks like supper's on the table, Mother. Is it? Well, where's sister? Well, Laura isn't feeling well. She thinks she better not come to the table. What nonsense. Law, honey, we can't be seated until you come to the table. Yes, Mother. This is your place, Mr. Connor, next to Law. Law, honey, you're keeping us waiting. Mother, I... Laura, you are sick. Oh, I'm so sorry. Tom, take your sister into the living room. You go in and rest yourself on the sofa, honey. Standing over a hot stove, Mr. Connor, made her sick. Oh? She's normally such a healthy girl. I told her it was too warm this evening. This rain ought to make things fresh and cool. Oh, yeah. She'll be all right, Mother. Well, I think we may have Grace now. Tom, honey, say Grace. Say what? Son, what do we usually do before we eat a meal? Argue. That's not a bit comical, Tom. I'm sorry. For that which we are about to receive, we thank thee, O Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, my goodness. Now, what's happened to the electric light? Hmm? Oh, they've gone out. Yeah. What do you suppose has happened, Tom? Well, I declare. Where was Moses when the lights went out? What? You never answered to that one, Mr. Connor. I heard it once, but it wasn't very nice. Well, now, it appears we'll have to dine by candlelight. Well, that's fine with me. That's because you're romantic, Miss O'Connor. I'll go fetch the candle. Mother knew why the lights went out. But a little matter, like an unpaid electricity bill, wasn't going to spoil her plans. After dinner, she assigned me to help her with the dishes. And as for Jim... Lloyd's all by herself in the parlor, Mr. O'Connor. Why don't you just go in and keep her company? Oh, sure, I'd like to. All right. Oh, hello, Laura. Hello. Feeling better? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, where will I put the candle? Oh, anywhere. Mm-hmm. How's this? That's fine. Oh, but now I can't see you. You're way over there. I can see you. Yeah, but that's not fair. I'll just have to come over there to you. Do you mind if I sit on the floor? No. Well, how about you? Don't you like to sit on the floor? Yes, I... I do. Well, why don't you? Uh, I will. <laughs> Here, take a pillow. There. How's that? Comfortable? Yes, thank you. Yes, am I comfortable as an old cow. Would you like some gum? No, thank you. You sure? Well, I think I'll indulge. Uh, with your permission, that is. Tom tells me you're, uh, you're shy, Laura. Is that right? I, I don't know. I judge you to be uh, an old-fashioned type of a girl, and that's a pretty good type to be. Oh, I hope you don't think I'm being too personal, do you? Oh, no. Oh, good. I, I think I'll have a piece of chewing gum now, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Thank you. Well, Mother, how are they getting along in there? How should I know? Because you were just listening to them behind the poor tears. I couldn't hear a thing. Well, if you want to listen, why don't you go in the dining room, sit down and be comfortable? I don't consider that any more amusing than you're not paying the light bill. All I know, this is the first young man we've introduced to your sister. I want it to be a success. Oh, I do so much want it to be a success. We'll hear Act Three of the Glass Menagerie shortly. When a sailor by the name of Patty Mosier was in Pusan, Korea, he saw a little boy collapse on a road because of malnutrition. He found many youngsters and old people dying for lack of nourishment. Having been brought up on a Virginia farm, Patty observed that the Korean soil looked good. Why no vegetables? The answer he found was lack of seeds. So he did something about it. 
He drew all his cash from the bank, $1,500, bought seeds and distributed them with the aid of religious missions in the area. Soon his crusade began to spread, and he was helped by contributions from people in the United States who heard about his project. There's no doubt that hundreds of hungry people owe their very lives to this sailor with a heart. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. The curtain rises on Act Three of The Glass Menagerie, starring Jane Wyman as Laura, Faye Bainter as Mrs. Wingfield, and Frank Lovejoy as Tom with Tom Brown as Jim O'Connor. I was telling you about the night Jim O'Connor came to dinner. The night the lights went out because I hadn't paid the bill. And how Jim and Laura were talking there in the living room. You know, Laura, I have an idea I've seen you before. Why, as soon as you opened the door, it seemed like I was... I was just about to remember your name, only... Only what? Well, the name I started to call you wasn't a name at all, so I didn't... The name? Was it Blue Roses? Blue Roses? My gosh, yes, Blue Roses. What? Why, I didn't even connect you with high school, but that's where it was, high school. <laughs> Say, how, how'd I ever get to call you Blue Roses? I was absent from school for a while with chlorosis. <laughs> and when I came back, you asked me what was the matter. You... You thought I said blue roses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is sure funny. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, sure, sure. You were the girl who was, who was always late. Well, it was very hard for me to get up the stairs. I, I had a brace on my leg then, and it clumped so loud. Ah, uh, I never heard any clumping. Oh, to me, it sounded like thunder. I used to have to go clumping up the aisle while everyone was watching because... My desk was on the far side. Oh, you, you shouldn't have been so self-conscious. Oh, I, I know, but I was. So that's why you sort of stuck by yourself, huh? Well, I, I've i never had much luck making friends. You know, Laura, people aren't so dreadful when you get to know them. Everybody's got problems. Oh, there are lots of people just as disappointed as you are. Well, it'll take me, for instance. You? Are you disappointed? Well, I, I sure thought that by now I'd be further along in the world than I am. You remember that wonderful write-up I had in the school yearbook? Oh, yes. And you were so popular. Everybody liked you. Including you? Yes, I, I did, too. Uh, how, how is Emily Meisenbach getting along, Jim? <laughs> that knothead? Well, why do you call her that? Well, that's what she was. You mean you're not going with her anymore? Why, oh, I've never even seen her. But it said in the personal section that you were engaged. Yeah, I know. But I wasn't impressed by that propaganda. It wasn't true. Only in Emily's optimistic opinion. <laughs> oh, but Emily was so pretty, and she always seemed to... Mother! Mother, now take it easy. Oh, what a nice young man. I do hope he appreciates love. Such a pity she had to collapse at the table. Did you see how beautiful he acted? Took no notice at all. Calm yourself, Mother. Remember what you always say. Possess your soul in patience. Oh, but in me, the thing you remember. Now, shush. I want to leave. Did you finish high school, Laura? No, I... I didn't go back. Hmm. Well, uh, what have you done since? Well, I took a business course at business college. Uh-huh. How'd that work out? I, I couldn't keep up with the others, so I dropped out. You know what I judge to be the trouble with you? Inferiority complex. I know. I had it, too. You didn't? <laughs> yes, sir. A lack of confidence in yourself. Oh. Yeah, for instance, that, that clumping you thought was so awful in high school, you see what it did? You gave up an education all because of a little clump, which is, well, <laughs> practically non-existent. Oh, but that's not true. You've seen me walk. And you know what my strong advice is to you? Think of yourself as superior in some way. Now, just look around you. Now, isn't there something you're more interested and superior in than anything else? 
Well, I do have my glass collection. Glass? <laughs> what kind is it? Little ornaments. Animals, mostly. Oh. They're right in back of you on the table. Huh? Oh. Oh, oh yeah. Here's an example of one if you'd like to see it. <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> oh, be careful. <laughs> if you breathe, it breaks. There. Now you're holding it gently. Yeah. Oh, what is it? It's a unicorn. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> unicorn. You see how the candlelight shines through him? Yeah. Yeah, say it. It sure does shine. I shouldn't be partial, but he's my favorite one. Unicorn. Uh, say, aren't they extinct in the modern world? Well, yes, but he doesn't complain about it. He stays with the other horses that don't have horns. They seem to get along very nicely together. <laughs> How do you know? Well, I, I haven't heard any arguments among them. <laughs> well, it's a pretty good sign. Uh, let's see if it stopped raining, huh? Well, looks to me like it stopped. Okay if I open the window? I, I wish you would. The air is nice after a rain. Lucy. Say, that must be coming from over at the Paradise. Yes, I listen to the band lots of times. Well, Miss Wingfield, how about cutting a rug? Oh, no. No, I can't dance. Uh oh, there you go again, that inferiority stuff. But I've never danced in my whole life. I, I'd only step on you. Oh, come on, Laura, try it. Look, just hold up your arms a little. Now, a little bit higher. There. That's right. But, but you don't understand. Now, I... now, now, don't tighten up. The main thing is to let yourself go. Now, come on. I'm I'm trying. That's it. Easy does it. Now just loosen the backbone. There. Now you're getting it? Am I? Sure, that's lots better. In my opinion, the waltz is one of the most The unicorn. Why I, I bumped into the table or I, it's broken. It, it's just the horn. The horn snapped off. Oh, gee, you your favorite piece of glass, too. Oh, it doesn't matter. Maybe it's a blessing in disguise. Uh, I'm sorry, Laura. Well, I'll imagine that he's had an operation. It'll make him feel less freakish. Now, now he'll be more at home with the other horses. Well, it's sure nice you have a sense of humor about it. Say, how about us going dancing at the Paradise? Oh, no. Yeah, well, why not? Well, I've never been there. Well, it's all the more reason you should go. No, I, I couldn't. Oh, there you go again. Oh, Laura, you're going to have confidence in yourself, and I'm going to give it to you. But what about Mother and Tom? Oh, I'll take care of that. Oh, Mrs. Wingfield. Mr. O'Connor, huh? did you call? <laughs> oh, I, I didn't know you were so close. Pardon me for shouting. Uh, Laura and I have decided to go dancing. Do you mind? Do I mind? Well, no, indeed I don't mind. Oh, thank you. And when you come back, I'll have refreshments waiting for you. Well, Miss Wingfield? May I have the first dance? Tom, Tom, you've done it. All right, Mother. What have I done this time? He's taking a dance and he's holding her arm. Oh? Oh, I dreamt and worried and prayed for this day. You have too, son. I know you have. But, Tom, it's all come true. It's all come true. Well, this is it, Laura. Now you know what it's like in here. Well, shall we dance? Well, couldn't couldn't we wait a little while? Oh, it's another waltz. Well, all right. <laughs> we'll show them how. How easy does it? That's it. Say, that's good. <laughs> Having fun? Sure you are. Hey, what's the matter? You got tears in your eyes. Oh no, no, no! It, it's just smoke, cigarette smoke. <laughs> I like the way you smile with your eyes. Doesn't everybody? Oh, no, not at all. Most people just smile with their lips. <laughs> Doesn't mean a thing. Oh, you're doing great, Laura. How do you think we ought to rest for a while? All right, Jim. You changed, Laura. Since high school? <laughs> Since just an hour ago. You stopped being bashful. Oh, honestly, I wish you could have seen your face just now on the dance floor. Well, you're just as pretty and different as... <laughs> Blue roses. Oh, you're <laughs> just saying that. 
Besides, blue is wrong for roses. Well, it's right for you. You are pretty. In what way am I pretty? In every way. Believe me. Oh, somebody needs to build up your confidence, that's all, and make you proud instead of shy and turning away and blushing. Somebody ought to kiss you. I guess I shouldn't have done that. Do you kiss girls? I, I mean, do you just say somebody ought to kiss you and, and then you do? Oh, Laura, no, 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 of course not. W would you care for a cigarette? Oh, no, you don't smoke. Well, well how about a mint? Uh, my pocket's a regular drugstore. You'd like a mint? No, thank you. Huh? Shall we go? But yes, let's go back home. You know, Laura, if I had a sister like you, I'd do the same thing as Tom. What's that? The same as Tom? Well, I'd bring fellas home to meet you. The type to appreciate you. Only, only Tom made a mistake about me. A mistake? Well, yeah, you, you see, I... Well, well, I can't take your phone number, and I, I can't call you up next week and ask you for a date. I, well, I just thought I'd better explain in case you misunderstood and I, I hurt your feelings. I'm glad you told me. Love said you, honey? Yes, Mother. I'll be right in with something cool to drink. You won't call again? I, I can't, Laura. I, I, I'm going steady with a girl named Betty. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I met her last summer on a moonlight boat trip up on the river on the steamer Majestic. You know, being in love has made a new man of me. Well... <laughs> Anyway, Betty's aunt took sick, and, well, Betty had to go to Centralia, so when Tom asked me to dinner, I... Now, I've made you children some nice liquid refreshment. Do you know that song about lemonade, Mr. Connor? Lemonade, lemonade, made in the shade, stirred with a spade, good enough for any old maid. Well, no, no, I, I never heard it, Miss Wingfield. Oh, why are you so serious, Laura? Oh, we were just having a serious conversation. Well, I know my place when young people are having a serious conversation. Oh, uh, don't go, Mrs. Wingfield. Uh, you see, I I've got to be leaving. Leaving? Well, you must be joking. It's only the shank of the evening. Well, you know how it is. You mean uh, you're a young working man and have to keep working man's hours. Well, it's not work, ma'am. It's, it's Betty. Betty? Yeah, she's the girl I go steady with. Oh. Is it... Serious? Well, we're gonna be married the second Sunday in June. Oh, how nice. Well, it, it's been a wonderful evening, Mrs. Wingfield, and I guess this is what they mean by Southern hospitality. It was nothing. It was nothing at all. Yeah, I, I promised Betty I'd pick her up at the Wabash Depot, and <laughs> some women are pretty upset if you keep them waiting. I know all about the tyranny of women. Goodbye, Miss O'Connor. I wish you happiness and good fortune. Oh, thank you. You wishing that, too, don't you, Laura? Yes, I do. Well, thanks again, Miss Wingfield. So long, Shakespeare. Goodbye, Laura. Don't forget the good advice I gave you. Here. Yeah. Well, what are you doing that for? I want you to have him, the unicorn, as a souvenir. Laura, I'm, I'm going to treasure this. And uh, sometime... It, if you and Betty have a free evening, I... We'd like for you to visit us. Thank you, Laura. Why are you smiling as though something good had happened? I've had a lovely evening, Mother. It makes you happy when I entertain a man who's already engaged to another girl. But, Mother, I danced tonight. I danced for the first time. I'm so glad I saw Jim. And where's Jim now? Hi, Kaelin, it down to the Wabash Depot to pick up Betty. Tom! Yes, Mother. Oh, the gentleman caller gone already? That was a fine joke you played on us. How do you mean? You merely forgot to mention that Mr. O'Connor was engaged to be married. Jim's engaged? So he just informed us. Well, I didn't know you that. You don't know anything. You live in a dream, you manufacture illusions. Laura, believe me. I, I didn't realize. I believe you, Tom. You had us make fools of ourselves. The effort, the preparation, the expense, all for what? Mother, it isn't Tom's fault. I just don't understand either. I've never understood my children. And as for you, young man, you're going to make up for what you've done to your sister. Where are you going? I'm going out. That's right. 
Don't let me interfere with your selfish pleasures. You know, the more you shout to me about my selfishness, the quicker I'll go. And it won't be to the movies. I don't care where you go. Walk out just the way your father did. We'll manage without you. I'm strong enough to take care of Laura. You go to the moon, you selfish dreamer. Tom, Tom, wait. Forgive me, Laura. Forgive you for what? Well, for running away and leaving you behind. I understand, Tom. Do what you've always wanted to do. Travel and and write. Thank you, Laura. Where will you go, Tom? Oh, far away. To the moon, maybe. Goodbye, Tom. I didn't go to the moon, but sometimes I think I went much further. I might have stopped traveling long ago, but I have the feeling that something's pursuing me. It comes on me unawares. It takes me by surprise. And all at once, it's just like my sister is touching me on the shoulder, and I turn around, and I look into her eyes. Laura, I tried to leave you behind me, but I'm more faithful than I intended to be. I can see you, Laura, you and Mother, and I can hear you talking. Laura, Laura. Yes, Mother. Now, do bring in your dress, honey. You got to stay fresh and pretty for your gentleman caller. What did you tell me a young man's name is? Richard. Richard? I've never known a Richard that wasn't nice. What time do you expect him, honey? Right now, Mother. Now? Look out the window. He's coming up the street. Why, why so he is. My, and such a nice-looking young man. The long-delayed but always expected something that we live for. Hello, Laura. Hello. And that's how I remember them. My mother and my sister. Our stars will return in a moment. Up in Newfoundland, there's an Air Force base called Fort McAndrew. Two tech sergeants were out on the field one day and noticed a nine-year-old girl hobbling around on a pair of crutches. She was a polio victim and a cripple. Her father, whom they finally located after much questioning of the girl, was a civilian employee on the field. He had eight children and simply couldn't afford the costly treatments that would be necessary to help his little girl. Well, that was enough for the two sergeants. They got up entertainments, collected donations, and... Well, soon every enlisted man, officer, and civilian worker around the place was in on the project. They raised $4,300, enough to fly the little girl to the United States and provide treatments at Warm Springs, Georgia. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, Mr. Cummings with our stars. And here they are, stepping forward to receive your applause. Jane Wyman, Faye Beta, Frank Lovejoy, and Tom Brown. To make the play for next week, Irving. Next week, we really have a spine chilling drama. One that'll keep you in constant suspense. The dramatic story of a woman who has only a few hours in which to save her husband's life. But she spends those hours in the hands of a desperate stranger. It's Metro Goldwyn Mayer's thrilling picture, Jeopardy. And starring in their original roles will be handsome, talented Barry Sullivan. And one of the finest actresses of the screen. Barbara Stanwyck. That will be an exciting evening. And good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. You gave us a wonderful evening. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.